Hello, I'm Liam and welcome to my video on what to grow in a polytunnel. I've had my polytunnel for eight years now and I've grown many things inside of it, including chilies, cucumbers, melons, inca berries and aubergine. But my favourite crop to grow are my tomatoes. They do really well inside here. It's made a huge difference in terms of how successful my growing is. My experience growing tomatoes outside was hit and miss. I always got some tomatoes, but many of the plants failed too. Whereas inside the polytunnel, my tomatoes are much more reliable and I harvest tomatoes from the end of June to the end of October. Not only do I get more tomatoes, the harvesting season is almost twice as long as growing outdoors. This reliability and the ease of growing compared to growing outdoors is also true for the other heat loving plants I've tried to grow. My polytunnel is also extremely useful in the spring, both for germinating seedlings and for growing on young plants. Even if what you would like to grow is different to the list I've just given, I hope this video will still be useful to you. Because what I've learnt is that although a polytunnel makes growing easier, there are many things to learn along the way. Having a polytunnel creates its own set of challenges that I've needed to learn how to deal with. Overall, my polytunnel is both the most expensive single item on my allotment plot and also the thing I enjoy using most. And that's because growing crops inside my polytunnel is more successful. And what I grow inside it are vegetables that I really enjoy eating, like tomatoes, chilies, and peppers. My plan is that this video will be part of a series of videos about polytunnel growing. And if you'd like to see these videos, please subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate any comments on the videos I make, and I do my best to answer them. And if you like the video, please click the like button. I've also got a website about growing fruit, vegetables and herbs, which you may like to see, and that's allotmentbook.co.uk. Before talking about what to grow in a polytunnel, I think it's helpful to talk about what a polytunnel actually is. What I mean by a polytunnel is a durable structure that stands out on the plot all year round. As I mentioned earlier, I've had my polytunnel for eight years, and it is still standing without the need for any major repairs and with the original polythene cover. My polytunnel is about three meters wide and five meters long, which is a good size for me. I certainly wouldn't want anything smaller or narrower. A longer polytunnel would be even better, but that would be more expensive. And on price, a polytunnel like this will cost many hundreds of pounds to buy. It's a hefty investment, but in my view, worth it. If I had to make a choice between buying a shed or a polytunnel, I would definitely choose a polytunnel. Polytunnels cost what they do because of the materials they're made from. Their poles are more like the poles used for scaffolding around houses in terms of strength and thickness. They're not quite as thick as that, but they are in that direction. The poles are much stronger than those provided on many cheaper plastic greenhouses. And then there is the polythene cover. This is thick and strong, designed to be stretched tightly over the poles. This stretching also helps provide strength to the whole frame. Just as importantly, the polythene is UV stabilized, meaning that it does not degrade in the sun and is designed for many years of life. A quick word on plastic greenhouses by comparison. I've seen many come and go down here at my neighbor's allotments. By go, I mean blown away by strong winds. Where I live in the south of England, Every year, there may be three or four big storms passing through with strong winds. And plastic greenhouses often don't survive these. But I have nothing against plastic greenhouses. I'm just using these as a comparison. If I had a sheltered spot on my plot, or at home, where the wind could not get to it, a plastic greenhouse would be okay. They're often not as big as a polytunnel, but they can be much cheaper. But on an exposed site where the wind can get to them, it can be a case of buy it cheap buy it twice. I mentioned at the start of the video that there are challenges of growing in a polytunnel and these are all related to temperature. Polytunnels can be cold at night, too hot in the day and because of the high daytime temperatures create a strong demand for watering in order to keep plants alive. Taking these in turn by the start of the growing season the first problem to overcome is nighttime temperatures. 
What is great about polytunnel is how quickly they heat up with only a little sunlight. I have a thermometer hanging up in my polytunnel, and when it's five degrees outside in February or March, it can easily be mid 20 degrees inside the polytunnel if the sun is out. What this means is that a polytunnel is great for germination. Many seeds germinate well with warm daytime temperatures, even if it is cool at night. Compared to a cold frame, a polytunnel is much bigger. And if a gardener puts shelving or tables inside the polytunnel, the space available for germination is huge. Whether growing onions from seed, brassicas like sprouts, broccoli and cabbage, herbs, or even germinating flowers like dahlias, nasturtiums and marigolds. Starting these off inside a polytunnel is easy. The problem is that this is not the whole story. When the sun is not shining in the day or at night, temperatures can rapidly drop off. A polytunnel is not double glazed like our house windows and cold can get in either through the doors at each end or along the sides if, like mine, the polythene cover is attached to wooden battens that run along the base of the polytunnel rather than being buried in the ground. By cold, I mean the nighttime temperatures can be just a degree or two above the outdoor temperature. Now, provided the outside temperature is above zero, this is not a big problem. Inside a polytunnel, the plants are protected from wind chill and this can make a big difference. But from March to May, there is still the possibility of a sudden sharp frost of a few degrees below zero. This often happens on sunny days with clear skies, when the temperature inside a polytunnel can reach 40 degrees during the day and then suddenly drop to minus 5 at night. This huge range of temperatures will kill off heat-loving seedlings of plants like tomatoes, chilies, peppers, aubergines and squash like cucumbers, courgettes and summer and winter squash. I've learnt this the hard way and I've adapted my growing in a number of ways. Firstly, I've tried to remove as many drafts as possible from getting into my polytunnel. For example, using draft excluders around the door frames and covering my net doors with plastic to help keep the heat in. I also use plastic greenhouses inside my polytunnel. This provides double insulation for my plants and keeps them warmer. I keep a close eye on the weather forecast and if a frost is predicted, I'll throw fleece on top of my plastic greenhouses to help keep them warmer. If the frost is particularly severe, I'll move plants into my shed or home for a night to protect them. And to mitigate against a complete disaster, I always like to keep some plants growing safely inside on my sunny window sills at home. For many heat loving plants like tomatoes and cucumbers, it is possible to take cuttings to help replace any plants that are lost to the cold. The second challenge to overcome is daytime heat. This can become a problem from mid-April onwards where I live. When the sun starts to climb higher in the sky and on a sunny day, my polytunnel can sustain a heat well into the 40s for several hours. This problem is even greater in high summer. On really hot days, the temperature will be in the high 50s inside my polytunnel. These temperatures are simply too hot for many plants. Whilst early in the growing season, my polytunnel is great for germinating traditional British crops like cabbage, lettuce, onion seed, spinach and chard. But when the temperature ramps up as spring fully arrives, these crops will really suffer if they are left inside my polytunnel. And even if the heat does not kill them, they may quickly run to seed. Therefore, when the warm weather arrives, I use my polytunnel only for heat loving plants like tomatoes, cucumbers, chilies, aubergines and peppers, or more exotic plants like melons, inca berries and tomatillos. As I said at the start of the video, a polytunnel is great for growing these crops. They really thrive with the warmth. They are much less prone to viruses when grown without rain touching their leaves and produce good amounts of produce over a long harvest period. But having said all that, even heat loving plants can get too hot. In summer, I maximise the amount of outside air entering my polytunnel. Some polytunnels have roll-up sides which help with this. But for my polytunnel, I can make do with making sure that fresh air passes through doors at either end of the polytunnel. To help reduce midsummer temperatures, I also decided to position my polytunnel where it would be semi-shaded by trees in the afternoon. This has made a big difference. I've noticed that the hotter side of my polytunnel the side that gets the morning and midday sun produces less harvest than the shaded side. 
And the third and final challenge for growing inside my polytunnel is watering. This is related to the high temperatures, which both bakes the pots I use to grow my plants in and requires plants to need to replace more water lost through their leaves. Large plants require more water, and this often coincides with the warmest days in summer. What this means is that plants will require regular watering every day, morning and evening, and on really hot days during the day as well. The best solution to this is a drip irrigation system that provides a constant supply of water throughout the day that can also be supplemented with plant food. The solution for how to provide drip irrigation will depend on whether an allotment has access to a mains water supply. Mine does not, and therefore I've created one using a collection of water butts, a solar panel for electricity, and an electric water pump. I've created a separate video on my drip irrigation system. This has evolved slightly from when I made the video, so I may update this, and I'll link to the latest video below this one. That's the end of my introduction to what to grow inside a polytunnel. For the rest of the video, I will show how my polytunnel has looked through each month through the growing season. And that's it. I hope you liked my introduction to what to grow in a polytunnel. If you did, please let me know by hitting the like button or leaving a comment. I'll try to create more videos on polytunnel growing. And if you'd like to see these, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in the usual way. You may also like to visit my website, allotmentbook.co.uk.